Hi everybody, uh, I'm Andy Williams. I'm knee surgeon in London at Fortius Clinic. And I've been asked to demonstrate the way in which I examine knees. The examination is absolutely crucial. I think in terms of making a diagnosis, 80% is on the history, 15% or so is from the examination, and probably 5% of the value comes from imaging. There are one or two killer things that imaging is crucial for, particularly osteochondral lesions, but actually the rest is about listening, asking the right questions, and examining the knee properly. Knee examination has become a lost art because of the success of imaging, particularly MRI scans. And it really is a terrible mistake simply to offer patients treatment according to their MRI scan appearances. Let's think what an MRI does. It measures water content of tissue. And so it's a very good test of uh, telling us perhaps what's wrong following trauma um, or with spontaneous onset disease. But it doesn't tell us how wrong. And particularly with soft tissue knee surgery where we consider knee ligament reconstructions, we really need to know how wrong something is to be able to work out the best uh, option in terms of treatment. And that's particularly so for the medial ligament complex and particularly so for the PCL. The radiological grading, unfortunately, does not correlate at all with the clinical grading. And MRIs may be reported as grade two or three, and they simply need some bracing and physiotherapy for the MCL and PCL. Then others are reported at grade two, and they need surgery, for example. So learning a good slick technique for examining the knee is absolutely crucial to practice. So I've already said that I think 80% of the power in making a diagnosis comes from history. And obviously there's a lot of extra detail, but you shouldn't leave the patient's side until you've asked them about four key things. One is pain, two, swelling, three, instability, and four, locking. And it's as simple as that. Now you go into detail with each of those four topics, such as swelling, rate of onset, when it occurred, is with pain, the nature of the pain, is it simply come on with loading, is, there pres is it present at rest, etc. But the key things are those four topics and they must be answered before you take the patient to the examination couch. So I'm now going to demonstrate the, the key parts of the knee examination that I undertake. Now, Louis has very kindly volunteered to help me with this. And I'll show you the on-couch part of the examination. But of course, it's critical to start examining the patient when you go out and greet them in the uh, waiting room. You can see how they walk. Once you get them uh, standing, you look at alignment, etc. All those things are absolutely critical, and you pick up a lot of information. But the on-couch uh, examination is probably the most important part. So I'm going to examine the right knee. Naturally, I will compare with the left, but for the sake of brevity, I'll simply demonstrate on the right knee today. So the first thing I do is I look at the musculature. I've already looked at the alignment when standing, and I, I'm looking for aspects of muscle wasting. Naturally, it affects the VMO region predominantly on the thigh, but don't forget the calf can also waste as well. I'm also looking for the natural depression that occurs uh, on the medial side of the joint. If it's obliterated, then there's going to be likely to be an effusion in the joint or some soft tissue thickening. Often you'll see surgical scars, particularly on the population that I treat who are professional athletes. It's a natural progression of their life to have a series of operations, uh, particularly if they're rugby players. It just seems that none of them get away with it. If you put together well in football, you may have a career without injury. But in rugby, it doesn't matter how well you're put together, when you collide with a man who's 130 kilograms, who can do 100 meters in nine point something seconds, it's gonna have a bad outcome. So I'm looking now, once I've made that initial inspection, first thing I look for is an effusion, and I would use a sweep test if there's no obvious uh, loss of the depression on the inside, and I stroke the potential fluid up, and I sweep it back from the supetella pouch. If this is obliterated, then I may go straight for um, a patella tap test. I compress the patella pouch, which increases the pressure under the patella, which will rise, and then I can tap that down. In this case, of course, this is negative. The next thing is looking at active and passive range of movement. So, Louis, if you could pull your toes up, set the quads tight, and lift the leg up straight. Now, drop it into my hand, relaxed. So I've got the active extent of extension, and now I've got the passive extension. And the two are the same in this case, there's no extensor lag. But if there was a flexion deformity as the limb lifted, and then it 
was reversed by passive extension that shows that the quadricep function is impaired. The last 30 degrees of extension requires 60% more power, so if there's any loss of muscle strength or inhibition, you'll see a lag. Now bend the knee, please, as far as you can. Very important to keep the foot off the couch, otherwise you may impinge on that and get a falsely lowered range of flexion. And go as far as you're comfortable, and then I'll take the passive range as well, and then come back to 90 degrees. So we've established the range of motion of that knee, and we can compare it with the opposite side. And there's huge variability in the population, particularly those with loose ligament laxity in terms of hyperextension, etc. I'm now going to sit on the foot, which is in neutral rotation. There's five, 10 degrees of external rotation. And so that's the natural position of the knee. So just going to sit on your foot, deliberate, not clumsy. And now I've got the limb in this position. I want to have the patient relaxed and I make sure they are, and Lou is. I can see that. And I'm going to palpate the joint line. So tell me if there's any uh, pain when I press on the skin. So here I palpate the medial joint line back to that depression in the post medial corner from the anterior space between patella, patella tendon, tibia, and anterior femoral, distal femoral condyle. And then repeat that on the outside. Again, any pain, you must let me know. No. Good. And I've successfully palpated. Now, if the extensor mechanism, if you palpate an extension, the patella tendon is tight and it's not that valuable. It's usually best to palpate in the relaxed extended knee. Patella tendinopathy, for example, would give exquisite tenderness with a relaxed extended knee when pressure is placed at the infrapole of the patella. The fat pack can be palpated, and again, pain may be obvious in extension, whereas in flexion, often you don't get it. Once we're in this position, next I'm going to evaluate the anterior cruciate and posterior cruciate ligaments. It's essential the limb is relaxed, so I just relax the uh, hamstrings and checking this way. I grasp the tibia and I pull straight forward in the sagittal plane, looking for the degree of displacement and then go posteriorly. And I concentrate hard so that I don't have to keep repeating it. So here we've probably got three millimeters of anterior draw, I'd say, and nothing on posterior draw. So if there is a positive anterior draw, then I will undertake secondary tests, the Slocum test. So first of all, I'll internally rotate the foot and tibia, and just hold the foot with my knee, and that tightens up the postlateral corner, and it should abolish the anterior draw. And in fact, it has tightened the anterior draw in this knee. And then I do the same in external rotation, and here we're looking to tighten the deep MCL. And from our research in Imperial College, it's clear the deep MCL is a very important secondary restraint to anteromedial tibial rotation with the ACL. And when it's intact, it abolishes the anterior draw. So persistence of anterior draw with external rotation will indicate a failure of the deep MCL complex. Um, failure of abolition with internal rotation suggests there's a postlateral corner problem. Next, extend the knee, and again, ensuring the patient's relaxed, and having it completely straight does allow them to relax. I bring the limb up, and if they see you struggle at all, they will tighten up. And the real trick, apart from having big hands, which I do, is to allow the limb to externally rotate and you take the whole weight of the thigh in your hand, put the elbow on your iliac crest for stability, and then you've got a very stable platform. And you can take the uh, tibia anteriorly with the Lachman test. And you can see here it's negative. Following that, I then take the limb up and start to flex it, look for the collateral ligament uh, examination. But as I flex, if there's a pivot shift, in the presence of an ACL deficiency, often you pick it up during that maneuver. So effectively, the first thing I'm looking for is a pivot shift, but if nothing much happens, I then look at the collateral ligaments. Now this is the classic way of examining uh, for collateral ligaments, but there are problems with it. You have the foot in your axilla, grasp the heel between your elbow and your uh, torso, and then move medially and laterally. The problem is you get hip rotation, particularly with women, young women who've got femoral neck antiversion, it's very easy to rotate. So you have to really concentrate and move in the coronal plane. Otherwise you get rotational movement which will confuse you. The other problem is that if you have anterior cruciate ligament deficiency in this position, the weight of the thigh allows the femur to drop posteriorly, the tibia effectively to sublux anteriorly, and you will tighten laxity of the medial lateral complex. And you can get a false negative for MCL or lateral ligament laxity when you do this. So it's far better with an ACL deficient knee to take the distal femur in the upper hand, uh, hold the heel, 
push up so that the femoral condyles are coapted to the tibia, apply valgus and apply varus. Of course, with a PCL deficient knee, the opposite is true. And in this position, the tibia is reduced anteriorly with the weight of the thigh going posteriorly, and you'll be able to get appropriate examination of the collateral ligament complexes. Once I've done that, I then do a formal pivot shift test um, to clarify the situation with the ACL. We we'll go on to other ligament tests later on, particularly specifically the postlateral corner with a dial test. But before that, because it's more practical, I go to the patellofemoral joint. And the first thing I do is raise my knee, pop it on the couch, and then flex the knee over it. And with a knee at about 20 to 30 degrees, it's an ideal position to examine the patella. First of all, the patient can relax because they're supported. So I can now look at the attitude of the patella, the patella tendon, and Next, I'll ask uh, Louis to lift his foot up, please, and straighten the knee, lock it right out straight, and back down. And what I'm looking for here is the passage of the patella up from the trochlear groove and out of it, it's unstable to the lateral side. If it's stable, of course, it goes straight up. By 10 degrees of flexion, the patella should have centralized in the trochlear groove. We did some work with a dynamic MRI scanner at St. Mary's many years ago and showed that all of the normal patients that we uh, scanned had a central patella in the trochlear groove by five to 10 degrees of flexion. So in other words, pretty quick. That's the reason why patellar alta is such a potential and potent cause of patellar instability because the patella basically doesn't get into the groove until late and so it's at risk of dislocation. The so-called J sign that describes bad tracking uh, starts with a patella localized in the center of a trochlear flexion, but as the knee extends, you will see the patella come off to the lateral side. And that's a so-called J sign. Next, I palpate the edges of the patella and I do a lateral push test. So I push the patella medially first and I assess how much of its width I've moved. So here, there's 50% of the width. And then as I go laterally, 50%. So the retinacular tension medially and laterally is well balanced. Whereas in people with instability, they may have laxity medially, in which case you can push the patella more laterally, may even obtain an apprehension to sign. They'll often move their hand to stop you, or you can see that they're frightened of what you're about to do, or you could sublux it out of joint. And then when I push from lateral to medial, I'm assessing the lateral retinacular tension. For me, the only indication for a lateral retinacular release at the same time as uh, MPFL or tibial tuberosity transfer or a combination is a patella that moves less than one quarter, one quadrant, of its width medially as I push it medially. So next we go on to the ancillary tests for the postlateral corner. A postlateral corner assessment starts with seeing the patient standing, if they're in varus and there's more varus, that worries me. If when they walk there's a varus thrust, again that's a worry. And then Houston test, I take both the great toes and I lift the leg up, hope this isn't too sore and just take your time, let me do the work. Just let them go all floppy if you can, that's great. And I lift up, and what I'm looking for is extra extension, plus the knee falling into varus, and you can often see the tibia externally rotate as well. So that's a, a Houston test. Next, you would examine and expect to find a loose lateral collateral ligament if the LCL is involved. And then the final test involves testing the rotatory stability that is uh, resisted by the popliteus complex. That's the popliteus tendon, muscle, and popliteal ligament, and that restrains external rotation. So for the dial test, although you can have an assistant help you with a patient supine, it's much better to do it by yourself with a patient prone. And what I've learned in the operating theater with a patient supine is my assistants probably do need to get gym membership, but I seem to be a lot stronger and I can externally rotate more than they do. The other thing is that you have to get your head absolutely midline to look down the limb. If you don't, you have a problem of an oblique view and you get a spurious feeling that one limb is externally rotating more than the other. So actually, if you can with an awake patient, it's better to do it prone. So make yourself as comfortable as you can. I know it's not easy. <laughs> and I'm going to bend your knees up and then I'm going to ask you to push your thighs together and try and go loose as you can. Now you want to get the knees together, and so Louis obviously feeling a bit uncomfortable. I can see his muscles are tightening up. So often it's a bit easier if I turn and rotate the femur a little. Very important that the ankles are dorsiflexed, otherwise you may get spurious movement at the ankles and the subtalar joints. 
and I start at 90 degrees and then I apply an external rotational torsion. Now, if it's positive, there'll be a significant increase in that rotation. And it's said that, um, that 10 degrees excess is, is positive. I would say actually less is of great relevance. Certainly five degrees worries me, and I would say that would represent a positive result. Then the question is, is this representing posterolateral rotatory instability, or is it anteromedial? And that's where I'm looking at the medial tibia and the fibula, if I can see it, to get a feel for where that rotation occurs. I then uh, come down to 30 degrees. At 90 degrees, part of the control of external rotation is the PCL. And if it's positive at 90 and not at 30, it's usually a PCL problem. It's an isolated lesion. But at 30 degrees, if you can just let your hamstrings go, go as floppy as you can, that's great. So always checking the limb is relaxed, locked up again, and twisting. And here I look right down the fairway, down the middle, and I can compare side to side. And of course, with Louis, uh, there's total symmetry. But at 30 degrees, if there's an excess, that's more specific for the posterolateral and tromedial uh, rotatory instability. Thanks very much, Louis. If you can just come back up, that'd be great. That really is my examination technique. As I say, you haven't seen the standing or walking part of it. Thank you very much.